New AI servers are using crazy amounts of power. Just to give you some idea, the new 72 GPU NVIDIA clusters are gonna use something like 120 kilowatts. Just for some sense of how much power that is being used every hour, the Tesla Cybertruck has a 123 kilowatt hour battery. So later this year, a cluster of 72 NVIDIA GPUs is going to use every hour about as much as the Cybertruck battery. Or in mileage terms, a AI cluster is going to use about the amount of power that it takes to drive a Cybertruck from maybe East Los Angeles to West Phoenix. And going a step further, by 2025, NVIDIA expects to have clusters of Blackwell GPUs, around 300,000 GPUs training single models. And maybe that's not the best example, but at least it gives some idea of how much power these AI servers are using and why they are completely transforming data centers. And there are a lot of folks that have absolutely no idea how fast this is changing. Liquid cooling may be cool, but power is what everybody in the data center industry is just totally focused on right now. So what I wanted to do was do a video where we talk about everything from how the basic compute servers are using way more power than in previous generations, all the way to these new AI clusters. And then I'm gonna show you not just the servers, but how we go into things like the rack, how do you go into the data center infrastructure, and then going to some really cool things. Like we're gonna see a little shed that is going to fart water and we're going to get power out of it. Now, of course, I do want to say a couple thank yous to different companies uh, for helping out with this. Like number one, Supermicro helped up by getting us some of these AI servers that we could just kind of show you some of the power supplies and stuff behind them. I also want to thank Vertiv for allowing me to go check out their facilities in Ohio. We got to go see one facility where they had things like hydrogen fuel cells, burn-in center, solar rays, all that kind of stuff. And we also got to go to their training center where they had a lot of the power features like battery backups and all the kinds of things that would go into a data center. I also want to say thank Thank you to the STH YouTube members who help pay for the plane ticket out to go see Vertiv in Ohio. And if you want to join the STH YouTube channel, so that way you can support videos like these, go find that button down below. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how power gets in servers and why this has changed, not just for AI servers. One of the big reasons is just frankly, what's happened to the CPUs and the servers in general. This is a older generation CPU, which would be something that like we would deploy used maybe 12 years ago or something like that. And you get four cores or six cores in about 60 watts. So about 15 watts a core would be pretty reasonable, maybe 10 watts. And then moving up the stack, you would get something like a Xeon E5. And when we were reviewing these, you saw a couple things. Like first off, these had maybe, you know, first generation was like up to eight cores. The final generation had up to 22 cores per CPU. But nowadays that's dwarfed by a modern system. And so what I have over here is a brand new Supermicro Xeon 6 server. Now we'll have the review of this probably after this video goes live, but you can see kind of in the background over here that we have our Xeon 6 video that's playing. We use the server as part of that. So if you wanna learn more about it, I'd say just go there. Now this is the lower power and lower end platform, but there are a couple big differences that are really showing you why power consumption has gone up so much on a per server basis. In here, in my hand, I have a 250 watt processor and it has 144 cores. So of course on a power per core basis, this is so much better, but around that you also need other their parts in your server to scale as well. A couple good examples of that is like, let's talk about memory. When you had something like a Xeon E5 chip like this one, you only had four channels of memory, so you could have a maximum of eight DIMMs per CPU. And then in the modern generation one over here, you can see that we have eight channel memory for 16 DIMMs per CPU. So you're literally doubling the number of DIMMs. And by the way, this is not even close to the highest end platform that we're even gonna see in 2024. I'll give you an example. This is an AMD Epic Genoa part, so 9004 Genoa part. We are gonna see the new Torin generation go up to 500 watts per socket. We're also going to see, you know, our memory channels already at 12 channel memory and both Intel and the AMD are gonna have that. So depending on what you were deploying maybe a decade ago, you're somewhere between maybe a 2X on the number of memory DIMMs that you have to 4X, which is a lot, but your processors are most likely up by I don't know, three, four X the TDP. And so where we often saw like a 200 watt total system power consumption for a dual socket server, you're not doing that anymore. Instead, a dual socket server, you're probably gonna be talking about somewhere between 500 watts and one kilowatt minimum. And you're gonna see well over one kilowatt without even adding any like crazy GPUs or NICs or anything like that. Oh, 
And on the subject of NYX, like, let's take an example of how that's scaled too, because as you have more cores, you have more, say, virtual machines, more applications that need bandwidth. So like this would have been a pretty decent NIC 10 years ago, right? Where you have dual 10 gig or 25 gig networking. But nowadays, this is a tiny little 15 watt slow thing. Instead, you have something like this, which is an NVIDIA Bluefield 3 DPU. But it's not just the networking on this. No, this has an entire CPU. It has an ARM CPU that's built into this. It uses like 75 plus watts. I mean, these things use a ton of power, but they also have a lot more capabilities. They run entire operating systems, whereas you used to just have a NIC. And so I think when we talk about server power, that's super important to keep in mind because whereas everybody thought about server power and rack power in a completely different scale than they're thinking about today, even for CPU compute. So taking a power supply out of here, something that you're gonna notice is that power supplies have gotten a lot bigger, not just in the physical size of the power supplies, but also in the amount of wattage that they put out. This is a dual socket server, not even necessarily like the highest end that we're gonna have this year. And just for that, it has a 2000 watt power supply. So if you're getting a modern server, the idea that your power supplies are these like 500 watt units, uh, probably is not gonna happen if you're getting a high-end server anymore. That makes things like the efficiency of power supplies super important because, well, if you're saving 2%, 3% on your overall power because you're not losing in your AC-DC conversion, well, then you're saving a lot of power on a per rack basis. These aren't just like single digit power gains anymore. They're more like double digit power gains in terms of wattage, of course. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how this works. So this is your power supply. And basically what it does is it takes AC input on this side and it outputs DC, usually 12 volt DC on the other side. Now this super micro server is designed for these redundant power supplies. You have two power supplies that each one can power the entire system. So if you have A and B power in your rack, you don't have to worry about the system going down. By the way, this server uses under 750 watts. The reason that this has a two kilowatt power supply is because you may go and put a whole bunch of GPUs or something like that in here. But talking about this two kilowatt power supply and this server is a really good example of why power supply sizing is important, but also it's really important to know what you're installing. Let me give you a good example of that. I can't tell you how many folks size their racks still to this day based on looking at how many servers they're gonna have in a rack, what the power supply output is, and they say, okay, well, that's about how much power I need. And so if you're sizing your racks based on that kind of math, you're gonna end up way overpaying for power in the data center. Power, by the way, is the number one cost driver that we're seeing these days in the data center. And by the way, we're talking about the CPU side here, but these same types of things are exactly paralleled on the GPU side as well. Not only are there CPUs in GPU and AI servers, but when you look at the power consumption of the servers, you can go back to something like our Deep Learning 10, Deep Learning 11 builds that we did back in like 2017 or so. And you would see that those systems used eight GPUs and you know back then the 1080 Ti was like the king of AI. And those GPU servers would tend to use somewhere in that like 2.4, 2.5 kilowatt range. Nowadays, an eight GPU system you can figure is gonna use at least eight kilowatts, if not going up, especially in the future generations. Next year, we're gonna see eight GPU systems easily cross 12 kilowatts. So just as something that's kind of fun, and we still talk about this a lot on STH, is that our first full rack that we got in California at that point had, I think, a 120 volt, like 15 amp circuit. And you know, seven to 10 years ago, we were able to go put an entire cluster of servers, dual socket servers, in that power envelope. But nowadays, well, maybe you're gonna be able to fit one, two dual socket servers in there. And that's one of the reasons that we look at so many low power options on STH, but also you're seeing a lot of folks look at things like single socket servers. It turns out that with today's modern single socket processors, you can get a lot of core density, but you can also use 2U servers and all that kind of stuff and still get a lot of consolidation. And so for lower end racks like that, well, that's pretty much your option. Because if we were to go and fill the expansion slots and drive bays in a server like this, we wouldn't be able to fill that rack and the reason for that is that if you were to go and fill this with all the expansion cards and drives and all that kind of stuff, well, we would go over the 1.4 whatever kilowatts that you can use in a 15 amp, 120 volt rack with the 20% safety margin. So where 10 years ago, people were building data centers and being able to put clusters in these racks, now you might get one server and you're certainly not gonna have a GPU server in there. I wanna show you what happens nowadays, what people are doing in terms of powering data centers nowadays and what some of the infrastructure is beyond just these servers and the PDUs that you would normally see in a rack.
Now, if servers are using more power, then certainly data centers are as well. I was talking to Vertiv and they're like, hey, why don't you come out to Ohio so you can go check out what we have? And so we went to two different campuses. One of them was super cool because it was the company's training center. Power solutions, of course, need to be installed and maintained. So you have to train people on how to go do that. And this is where that happens. It was also seen as a place that I could go play with things without electrocuting myself. And so continuing our journey, not only do we have things like our rack PDUs, which are pretty standard in the industry. I think most folks have seen these, but I didn't want to just stop at what's in the rack. I really wanted to get to what's beyond that. And so let's talk about some of the like power distribution that you have inside of a data center. And so two examples of that are that there is the Vertiv power bar and high power bar. The high power bar, of course, is the higher power version of this. But these are the power bars that like, let's say you have a row of 60 kilowatt racks and you just need to deliver a ton of power to a row. Well, this is something that you would use. And the higher power one, of course, uh, maybe that would be something that you'd use for like entire data hall or something like that. Now, one of the cool things is that you can move these tap off boxes. So you can put them anywhere you really want on the rail and then plug the PDUs from the racks directly into them. And you can move these tap off boxes pretty safely wherever you want them to go. They even let me do this, which was a lot of fun. And fun fact, apparently these are not just for data centers, also things like hospitals and places like that use these as well. So they're used in a number of locations where you may have to move power or change the type of power, like type of breaker and all that kind of stuff that you have. This is a solution for that where you can customize on a per rack or per, you know, tap off basis. Now there's a ton here. We're not gonna be able to cover everything, but one cool thing is that here is the Vertiv power board. Now the Vertiv power board is something that is like a giant circuit breaker and like switch for your entire data center. You're gonna need something that's much larger than what you have in your house. And that's really what this is. And one of the fun things is that the circuit breaker switches, those things are so big that to be able to maintain them, there's like a little hoist with a winch and stuff that is built into this unit just so that you can go and pull these things out safely. They're that heavy. Now one of the reasons that you have these giant switchboards and all that kind of stuff and switching gear and what have you is the fact that you generally in data center you have more than one type of power. It's not just power coming in from like one utility. Sometimes you'll have multiple utilities or multiple power feeds. Sometimes you'll have things like on-site battery backup. In fact most of the time you will. You'll have generators, you can have solar arrays, you can have hydrogen fuel cells which we'll get to in a little bit. And all of these things can be used to power your data center and they can be used depending on you know maybe one goes out and you need to have some redundancy. So you need a lot of this kind of switch gear and what have you. But one of the big things that makes any data center work is really the battery backup. And so because it takes a couple seconds for the generators to come online, you need a solution, a battery solution to handle when your main power dies and your backup power takes over. And so data centers tend to have multi-rack UPS systems. We've looked at them in some of our data center tours, but these things can be huge, like eight racks or more, and they can be cabinets outside or however they're configured, but there are huge battery backup systems that are generally in these data centers. Now, there are different battery chemistries, and one of the things with newer lithium batteries is that you'll see that a lot of times there are regulations on how far they need to be spaced apart, and that just in case uh, you know something bad happens, they have to have you know, containment for that. At the training facility, not only were we able to see these giant systems and different types of systems, but we were able to also see how people learn to even just service these. We should go take a look at what we saw at the Delaware, Ohio facility. Now, in Delaware, Ohio, it was a massive like manufacturing floor, it was just huge. And there was a part that we were able to show a little bit of, which are these massive bays. And if you're looking at like what the heck these like huge tower things are that go all these down these halls, these are actually load generators. So if you think about if you have a power system, something that some folks wanna see, like customers and stuff wanna see like, hey, does the gear actually meet the specs? And can it do things like, you know, a battery take the load or like a switch gear or something like that. And so these like massive load generators that are here just to be able to do that, it was so cool. There's also an area where you can go and do customer acceptance. So customers can literally sit there and watch and say like, okay, that looks like it works, let's go install it. And while there was a ton of switch gear and stuff inside, I really wanna get outside because I think there's some cool stuff there. Now, the first thing is uh, kind of the one that I think a lot of folks have seen before. There's a large solar array or large-ish solar array, for, at least for just a building like this. There's a total of one megawatts of capacity here. So as I'm walking by here, there's a airfield that's on the other side of this. And you can kind of see it from Google Maps, just how big this is. And just some perspective on how big one megawatt is, right? That's somewhere around eight to 10 of those Supermicro NVIDIA GB200 NVL72 racks. So in 2025, if you're doing high-end AI or high density AI, you can go deploy this one megawatt solar array and you're only gonna be able to power when it's sunny out and it's operating at peak efficiency 
frequency, like up to eight to 10 racks. Now, of course, a lot of the data centers that are built for training are gonna be in places with low power and land costs. So maybe putting a solar array helps at least hit your green power goals, right? And just for some sense of scale, again, this is one megawatt. We're gonna see 100 megawatt installations this year. So that just kind of gives you a sense of size of how much power you actually need in a data center. Now, the other thing that was on site was way cooler. There was a 400 kilowatt fuel cell. Now, in each of these cabinets, we have a hydrogen fuel cell and these cabinets generate about 200 kilowatts of power, but they also create heat and they create water in the form of basically vapor and also some condensation. So in essence, it takes in hydrogen and it outputs electricity, heat, and pretty much farts water. And of course, since you're emitting water vapor, this is considered a form of clean energy. And so if you have a solar array that maybe you run during the day, maybe you're running hydrogen fuel cells at night, that's an idea of just kind of like, you know, how you can scale up or at least get some of your power generation to happen, not via, you know, some of the other power sources that are out there and really using clean and renewable power sources. So in the container, of course, we have our 200 kilowatt each fuel cells, but we also have a lot of safety gear and all that kind of stuff that you need for a fuel cell. But you, of course, need to have hydrogen tanks. So those were in a yard and a trailer across the way that has to be fenced off. And there are a whole bunch of regulations on how you store the stuff. And the other thing you have to be able to do is resupply your hydrogen and have the ability to go and like, you know, cut over between tanks and all that kind of stuff to keep your fuel cell going. So we've covered the one megawatt solar facility, the 400 kilowatt hydrogen fuel cell. But the other thing they had was the Vertiv Dynaflex battery energy storage system or BESS. Of course, they have all the uninterruptible power supplies and all the switching gear that allows them to take things like feeds from utilities, plus the solar array, plus the batteries, plus the, uh, you know, fuel cells and put those all together into a grid that they can use. And just to give you some sense of scale on how big one megawatt is just as a little test and demo system, Frontier is the number one supercomputer on the top 500. It's going to be dwarfed, of course, by AI systems just this year, but that is, I think, like around 23 megawatts. So the system we're looking at today, that's really focused on a more of like a one megawatt build out. A giant supercomputer these days is something like 23, 24 megawatts, and we're going to see 100 megawatt AI training clusters, 100% we're going to see them this year. Now, of course, we're only talking about the power side here. And one of the reasons for that is we've done so much on liquid cooling already. Everyone in the industry, including Supermicro and Vertiv, which we featured here, are doing liquid cooling in some ways. And while some people question about like, you know, how liquid cooling will shake out over the next couple of years, there's something that is very obvious, right? Which is liquid cooling is gonna happen in the data center in some form, especially with all the high-end like AI clusters and stuff like that, you're definitely gonna see that. Now, if you're using like the Xeon 6, 250 watt, 144 core parts, you're probably not gonna be liquid cooling those. You can two air cool those, no problem. But when you're starting to talk about like the big AI systems, it's something that you definitely need to look at these days. Still, when people are building for AI clusters, number one, they are looking at power, but number two, they're also looking at cooling. Now, hopefully you like this look at AI server and server power consumption and how server power works all the way through to like solar arrays. I just wanted to get a reference piece and we're gonna have a number of STH main site articles that are gonna tie to this video, but I wanted to get this content out there just because power is such a big topic in the industry. You may hear a lot about liquid cooling, but number one, people need to go find power and figure out how they're gonna deliver enough power. And my hope is we get to show you some of these very large installations in the coming months. Now, if you did like this video, please share it with your friends, but also give it a like, click subscribe and turn on the notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.